So I want you to join me in a little experiment. First, imagine that you have a day off, which is probably a big deal for many of us here. But instead of doing what you normally do on your day off, you don't make any plans. You get on a bus or you get on a train and you go to downtown Chicago with no plans. You go to a museum you've never been to. You walk by a restaurant that looks interesting. You eat there and you shop someplace that you've never been. Now, that is an easy thing for many people. It's one day, it's, it may be a little out of your comfort zones, but it's taking you somewhere that you haven't been. So imagine that you do that and that feels comfortable to you. So let's take it up a notch. Imagine that you have uh, a Friday off and you decide that you want to do something for your long weekend, but instead of making plans, you pack a bag, you get in your car, and you head towards the nearest interstate and you drive for a couple of hours until you find some place that looks interesting. You find a hotel, and you explore a town that you've never been to for two days, and then you come back home. Again, for some people, that would be outside of your comfort zones. For many, you might be able to actually find yourself thinking about doing that. So let's take it up one more notch. Imagine that after that feels good to you, you have an actual entire week or 10 days off. Instead of making plans, you pack a bag and you park your car in long-term parking at the airport. You walk in and you buy a ticket to some place that you've never been before without planning in advance. You fly there and you spend a week in a city that you've never visited before. And then you fly back home again. So if that feels good to you, then you will certainly understand the concept of wanderlust, which is part of my talk today. What is wanderlust? All of that is uh, the way that somebody might deal with wanderlust. And wanderlust is one of these awesome German hybrid words. It comes from the German verb wandern, which means to wander, and the German word lust, which means passion. So wanderlust means a passion for wandering. But for me, it's not just about travel. Wanderlust, I think, for everybody is more about a passion for experience a passion for learning, a passion for newness, for actually gathering data. So for me, the concept of wanderlust is not just about moving somewhere physically, but it's about gaining experience and learning new things. From the description of uh, my talk earlier when Troy came out here, you've heard how many different careers I've had and how many places I've lived. All of that is an outgrowth of wanderlust. So what causes this? Why do people have this impulse to move and to travel? Well, first of all, I think everybody has had it, even if it's just for a tiny moment. It may be a moment where you feel trapped in a situation and you feel like you have to get out of it. Or it may be a time when you feel really frustrated with a project or with a relationship or with something and you just know that you need to change something. Uh, for some people, it may just be aggravation. You're just irritated at something, and you just need to get away from it. And the best way to get away is to escape. So, so everybody, I think, has felt wanderlust. But uh, and occasionally, I think that people have it because of something they see. They'll watch an awesome documentary about New Zealand and suddenly think, I have to go there. Or somebody will come home from an amazing vacation and tell you about it and show you their photos, and you'll suddenly think, I, I need to go to that place, and it will start to consume you until you do something about it. So I think everybody has touched this energy. But for many of us, and for someone like me, it's a constant feeling. It's not just an occasional thing. So for me, um, you know, I have to think, what causes this? And I'll tell you how, for me, it plays out and how I kind of understood uh, that I had this. Here at Moraine Valley, we're on the flight path to Midway Airport, and I live in Berwyn, and I'm also on the flight path to Midway. Every single time I see a plane, the first thing that I think is, those people are so lucky they're going somewhere. That's the first thought that enters my head. It's not, oh look, Southwest Airlines flying over Moraine Valley. It's, I want to be in that plane and go wherever they are going. So I have this constant desire to be somewhere that I'm not. Now, sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes it's not a good thing. But I think um, you've heard the quickie history of all the jobs that I've had. What causes that, I think, for me, is what I call non-belonging. I think everybody, like Wanderlust, everybody has had moments of feeling like they're in the wrong place at the wrong, wrong time, whether it's you suddenly realize the job is not working for you, or that the relationship is not quite right, or that nobody around you seems to understand how you're feeling about something. So I think all of us have touched the edges of moments of feeling like we don't belong. 
But for some of us, and for me, it's a constant feeling, and it's what I call serial non-belonging. So today's talk is really more about serial non-belonging. What does that mean, and how does it play out, and how might it actually apply to you and your life? I think that those periodic moments of feeling that you are in the wrong place or you don't fit um, are kind of, in many ways, not so hard to deal with ultimately because they come and they go and then you feel fine again. For somebody like me who is a serial non-belonger, those moments are always there and so I may have moments of feeling okay where I am, but ultimately deep down I never feel like I'm in the right place. I always feel like I'm supposed to be somewhere else. Um, and so those, those periodic moments are pretty easy. Uh, the not periodic moments become a little harder. Now there are pros and cons. First of all, the con is that you do feel like an alien sometimes, like you've been beamed in from a foreign planet and nobody understands you. Uh, there are moments of incredible aggravation and frustration because you realize that you're looking around and everybody in your life is looking in one direction and you're looking in another and you don't get it. What are they looking at? you should be looking over here. So it can be very frustrating. On the pro side, however, having these moments of understanding your non-belonging are very powerful because they're places of creativity. They're places of passion and they cause you to make choices that move you forward sometimes. So I think that it can be a very positive thing. Um, the, there, when you feel that you don't belong, I think there are a multiple choices that you can uh, talk about to deal with it. So I would say the people who have periodic feelings of it, as well as serial non-belongers like me, uh, can often uh, survive by hiding. So the first place that you might go is to say, okay, I don't feel like I fit in with this group, so I'm going to separate myself from this group and hide from them. In my case, it was when I was a child, it was reading. Uh, I would come home from school and go read a book until I had to have dinner with my family who I thought were all weird, strange people that I didn't belong to. And then I would go back and finish reading the book and go to bed and then go to school the next day. Reading is a wonderful thing. For me, sometimes it becomes an escape in a negative way. It becomes a way to go into a fantasy world and not deal with the world that I am in because if the world is painful, I don't want to deal with it. So you can sometimes hide uh, if you are feeling like you don't belong. Uh, another way that non-belongers kind of cope with the world is through camouflage. You pretend to belong. We're great actors, most of us. So we can go for very long periods of time without anybody realizing that we don't feel like we fit in with their group because we can really make them believe that we do. And the trick there is that sometimes we're so good at it that we convince ourselves that it's true as well until the one day you wake up and go, where am I? Uh, what happened to me. But I think all of us develop the ability of camouflage. So I think sometimes when you feel out of place, you can just pretend that you belong. And sometimes the pretending is enough. I think sometimes non-belongers will rebel. And there's what I call quiet rebellion and active rebellion. Quiet rebellion uh, can sometimes be a positive thing. So I have a, a friend actually who uh, feels very much like I do and so she's created an anonymous blog where she goes and she just vents everything that she's feeling to the world under an assumed name and she feels a whole lot better after she gets it out on paper. Um, a negative way of, non, of uh, what I would call quiet rebellion is what I would call self-sabotage and I think all of us have probably done this before where you know something is wrong but you choose not to deal with it but by not dealing with it, you then allow other people to start making choices that push and push and push against your comfort level until they force you to change and then you can blame them for it instead of taking the responsibility on your own. And I think all of us unfortunately have had those moments where by not de deciding not to do something, we've let other people make decisions that then cause us to go into crisis and we then have to react to that crisis. But I think that comes, for me, from that sense of feeling out of place and not comfortable with dealing with it. Um, so we have hiding, we have camouflage, we have uh, quiet rebellion, but there's also what I would call active rebellion. Occasionally, if you are a non-belonger or a serial non-belonger, you reach a point like steam building up in a pot. And if you haven't dealt with your feelings, it will explode out. So let me give you just two interesting examples from my own life. Uh, when I was in high school, 
I was what you would call a perfect student. Teachers loved me because I was quiet, I was polite, I was respectful, I was a straight A student, and I was the valedictorian of my high school class. So two weeks before graduation, every year the senior class did a talent show, um, and they did this senior prophecy thing where uh, the seniors would march across the stage and the class president would read the, in 10 years, I will be fill in the blank that the senior had come up with. And a lot of them were goofy, you know, what will I be doing in 10 years? So they asked me to be the MC of this event uh, because I was the actor person in the class. And I said, sure, I'll do this only if I can read my own senior prophecy, which they had no problem with because I was a perfect student who never rocked the boat never did anything wrong, was never in trouble. Everybody did their senior prophecy. I come on stage and I say something goofy about in 10 years I will be a starving actor in New York waiting tables, um, that verbatim I said after that, but at least I will have had the conviction to follow my dreams without crumbling under the blows dealt by the mindless conformists that I have dealt with for the past 12 years in this school. Thank you. There was horror in the administration when they realized that I was going to be giving a valedictory address in two weeks. Um, I managed to dial it back for my valedictory address, but I, I made my point. But that was an act of open rebellion. The one time I ever tried waiting tables, which for me was the most horrible job in the world, I just not right for me. Um, instead of calling in and giving my notice, I decided that I would quit in the middle of lunch rush because it was dramatic enough. So I actually flung my apron at the manager of the restaurant who said to me, you can't do this. And I said, as far as I know, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. I can do whatever I want. And I stormed out of the restaurant. So those would be moments of knowing you don't belong and blowing up instead of acting rationally. But you know, ultimately, it all, it all works out. The, that can happen to anybody who has moments of non-belonging, but for a serial non-belonger, I do think there's uh, two other choices that I want to talk about. One of them is, is probably the funniest, but it's probably the most important. When you feel like you don't belong, like you're a misfit, if you can find other people who feel that way and band together, then you can all not belong together. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it's kind of like that island of misfit toys in Rudolph, where they all felt they didn't belong until they all got together and went, hey, wait, we all don't belong together. And for me, that was the theater. Uh, I started taking acting lessons when I was about 14 years old, and I suddenly realized that all of these other people were making a really good effort at looking like they fit into their lives, but honestly, none of us did. We all felt like aliens in our world, but together, we could be aliens all together. Uh, and we were intensely creative and we had a wonderful time. So there's a great support group if you can find other people who feel like you. For me, however, the most important and I think probably the best way to deal with this kind of energy if you ever feel it is to take a deep breath and go with it. Go with the flow and find that point of action. So let me give you just a couple of quick stories. When I graduated from college, you know, I never decided what I wanted to do. I had two um, degrees, two minors, and enough credits and two other things that I could have had two more minors if I had actually stayed for another couple of semesters. So I graduated with 210 undergraduate hours. Um, but after I left school, I stayed and became a floral designer, which had nothing to do with anything that I was doing, but I was saving up money to go to grad school. And I knew I had applied to grad schools, I knew kind of where I wanted to go, but I decided to put it off for a couple of years so that I could earn enough money so that I wouldn't have to take out so many student loans. But about a year into that, I was at a Christmas party and a friend of mine had been telling a story about backpacking through Europe. And I became so entranced by this that when we ran out of ice, I actually said, I'll get the ice. I stopped at a Kinko's and had a photo taken, applied for my passport the next day. Three weeks later, I gave my notice. I did a summer job at a theater, and then I got on a plane and flew to Europe and went backpacking for four months by myself. It seems like it was a whim, but I think it was coming for a long time. When I graduated from my master's degree program, I was offered two jobs. The first was to be the assistant to the director of development at the University of South Carolina because they realized that I was very good at raising money, good salary, good benefits, living in my hometown where my family lived, or to join two friends of mine who were running a children's theater in Pennsylvania who wanted to open an outdoor Shakespeare in the Park festival. Guess where I went? I, yeah, you know where I went. Um, 
totally blew my mother's mind. She thought, my son is going to starve to death, and he's going to come live with me forever, and I'm never going to get rid of him. Um, but it all worked out. And then finally, how did I get here? In 2007, the job that I had was not going well. I, I was miserable. I was unhappy. I was getting physically ill every day that I drove to the, the place where I was working, even though I was doing what I wanted to do. I was running a theater. I was doing everything that I'd always said I wanted to do, but it was a very bad situation. So I applied for 12 jobs. Uh, eight of them gave me polite rejections. Four of them interviewed me on the phone, and two of them flew me out for job interviews, including this one. I had never been to the Midwest before. I did not know anyone in the state of Illinois. I took the job. Um, they offered it to me in November. I gave my notice, left New Hampshire um, in mid-December to come out and find a place to live. I found a random apartment that I still live in seven years later. In January, I showed up to the Midwest with you know, a van load of furniture, not knowing a single human being here, and I've been here for seven years. Um, many people were horrified by that back in New Hampshire where I had been living for 10 years, but here I am. So again, I reinvented myself because I took a deep breath and went, I am in the wrong place. These people are not my people. Um, I don't fit here, and I need to go find new people. I need to go find a new situation. So I did it, and here, you know, here I am. So for me, I would say, I, I don't want this to be all about me. I really want it to be about everybody who is watching or listening to this presentation. So what are the takeaways for all of you? Uh, there are some of the same takeaways I have. First of all, it's a takeaway of no blame. I've had many horrible things happen to me in my life. People have died. People have betrayed me. I have gone through bankruptcy. I have lost a home um, to, you know, to the bad economy. Uh, all sorts of things like everybody may have had out there. Uh, and there have been moments where I blamed other people for many of these things. But ultimately, after taking a deep breath and moving on to my next adventure, I don't blame anyone. It's all about me. So I take responsibility for all of my choices and all of my actions. And so even though I'm angry or frustrated and may temporarily blame other people, when it comes down to it, it's about my choices and about me being in that relationship with that person who betrayed me. So I have to take my responsibility. So I would say, first of all, if you feel like you are a non-belonger, don't blame your parents. Don't blame your family. Don't blame your friends. Don't blame the world. It's who you are. So take responsibility for yourself. Second, when you are a serial non-belonger and you make these drastic decisions that move you somewhere new in your life, people who love you will push back on you. That does not mean they are bad people, because whenever you change, everybody in your life is forced to change along with you even if they don't want to change. And it can be as simple as you dye your hair some color that your spouse hates, and now suddenly they have to deal with your new hair color. They're going to push back on that. Or if you change jobs, people will push back because they don't want to change. Some will be we're supportive. Let's give them credit for that. Others, however, will push. So be aware that this will happen. You'll get pushed back, and you may get pushed right back to where you were, um, or you may just push through it and move on. Uh, but don't assume that these are bad people because they're pushing back on you. They, they're just afraid. They're afraid of your energy, and they're afraid of the change that you're making them make. The third takeaway is resiliency. People who are serial non-belongers learn to bounce. Um, the, I keep thinking of how many of you are Winnie the Pooh fans out there? Many of you. Remember Tigger? Tiggers are bouncy, 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 fun, 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 fun. Uh, when you are a serial non-belonger, you learn to bounce. You learn to move to the next thing. And you're fun, because I think serial non-belongers, because they gather so much experience, are fun. But remember the other thing about Tiggers? They're the only one. Bouncy, bouncy, fun, fun, fun. He's the only one. We're very unique kind of people. So if you are a non-belonger kind of person and you are resonating to what I'm saying, understand that one of the reasons you feel alien is that you are. You are alien. You're different than some of the people in your life and around you. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because you will develop the concept of resiliency. Uh, the, the, the next takeaway, I think, is creativity. When you embrace that moment where you suddenly realize that you feel like an alien or you feel like you don't belong, you're at your most vulnerable at that moment, but you're also at your most powerful because that's where creativity happens. You cannot be creative if you are not vulnerable. 
So when you embrace the concept that you're, something is wrong and you start to realize what it is and you start to assess what your choices are, in that moment you're incredibly vulnerable, so that's where the pushback can be painful, but you're also incredibly powerful. It's both terrifying and exciting at the same time because you suddenly feel like you've been pushed off of a cliff and you have to learn how to fly, but you do. Or like bumbles in, in um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you bounce. Bumbles bounce. Um, so understand that that's your place of creativity. You are at your most vulnerable, but your most powerful in those moments when you are faced with the concept of needing to make some kind of change in your life. And then I think the final takeaway is that this is an okay thing. This is a valid life choice because it's not really a life choice, it's who you are. You're responding to the way that you were created. And I think some people are wired differently than other people. And when you understand that just because society says you need to get one job, you need to get a house with a white picket fence, you need to have a great 401k, you need to plan for your retirement, blah, 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 fill in the blanks. Just because other people say that to you, if that doesn't feel right to you, it's not right for you. Uh, it's like anything that's told to you, until you embrace it and make it your own, it's just words. Uh, and we heard in another speaker about you can't just pour knowledge into somebody and expect that they will become educated. For this, you can't just gather all that data from other people and expect that it works for you. It has to resonate in your spirit and in your soul. So I think the important takeaway for everybody is that this is a creative, exciting way to live. It's scary. Yes, it's terrifying sometimes, but it's also powerful and exciting, and it's okay. So for me, the big takeaway for everybody is that you know, hiding, faking it, rebelling, that's still going to happen. You're not going to suddenly not do all of those things because those are survival mechanisms. But finding other people who are like you and then acting on these impulses sometimes are really the ultimate expression of you who you are. So for me, Wanderlust, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, is not just about travel. It can be about travel, but it's about reaching out and gathering experience. And sometimes that means that you have to go outside of your comfort zones and go somewhere else that you have never been in order to gather that piece of information. So thank you all today. I wanted to just share that with you in hopes that some of you who feel this way might actually resonate a little bit and learn a little bit more, not just about this, but about yourselves. So thank you.